Michael Arevalo has our scripture reading today. Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 31 through 46. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needed clothes, and, and we clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will re reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needed clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He replied, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For those of you who don't yet know, maybe the newer faces in the crowd, our church is a little bit obsessed with sheep. If you take a tour of our church building, you will find sheep on the walls, sheep in the bathroom. You'll even find a food truck with a sheep on it. And sheep dog toys keep showing up, the squeaky ones. I'm guessing it's just belongs to Rufus and they're all over the place. And it gets even more absurd than that. When the pandemic first started months ago, I was given a sheep mask by a congregant, like a sheep mouth, I kid you not. And one of our former interns turned long-term staff members, Mary Kiner, actually got a tattoo of our logo, a sheep, on her forearm. We are a people obsessed with sheep. And it all centers around our mission statement to feed more sheep. So, as a sheep-happy people, we have skin in the game with this text. This text that calls Jesus a shepherd of sheep. This text that calls Jesus king. I do say sheepishly. Today is Reign of Christ Sunday. The last Sunday, as I mentioned earlier, but of ordinary time that falls between Pentecost and Advent. Two major events in our annual cycle of faith. And this is the day that we remember Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the King. When we think of reign of Christ, we surely conjure up images almost mishmashing together like Game of Thrones, but the Book of Revelation, putting, you know, a large manly being seated on a golden throne that is perfectly perched on a voluptuous cloud in the sky. But this text that the lectionary hands us today is almost trolling us, flipping all of these traditional kingly images on their heads, presenting us with Jesus, the lowly shepherd. This is the last parable in a series of parables that Jesus tells his disciples in what's called the Little Apocalypse in Matthew. In Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus delivers parable after parable to his disciples in the final week of his life. A few parables before this one, Jesus gives a parable, gives a story about 10 bride, bridesmaids, five of whom were not ready for the return of the bridegroom. And then immediately after that, he tells a story about a master going away and leaving the property to three of his servants, telling them to take care of it while he's on a trip. Now, Jesus is clearly preparing or trying to prepare his disciples for his death and eventual return. 
And then this text comes, the one that Michael just read for us today. And it's the last thing that Jesus says to his disciples in one of these disciple-only teaching moments before Jesus goes to the cross. Some might even say that it's a summary of all of his teaching. In this parable, though not really too parable-y, by the way, Jesus is depicted as a shepherd. Now, in Palestine at the time, shepherds routinely had mixed flocks, both goats and sheep, and at night would have to separate the sheep from the goats, as sheep preferred the open air of pasture while goats needed to be protected from the fold. And what's more, sheep and goats couldn't look more different. Syrian goats were a jet black, while sheep were an ivory white, despite the fact that they, their bones looked almost identical. Shepherds could tell a sheep from a goat in the dead of night without even batting an eye. So as we read this text, we probably can't help but wonder, well, where am I in all this? Am I a sheep or am I a goat? And although that question may be helpful, as in, insofar as it can provide a sort of like a doctor's checkup, realigning us if we have grown apathetic to the poor, it may not be the most fruitful question for us to center ourselves upon today. Namely, because the interpretation of this text is hinges upon two different terms, ponte te ethne in Greek and mikroi. Ponte te ethne, translating to all the nations, and mikroi, translated to the little ones. Now, for the vast majority of this telling and retelling and the explaining of this text, ponte te ethne was thought to mean Christians only, that Jesus was judging the righteous from the unrighteous Christians. But in the 18th century, a new interpretation emerged, one that was actually rooted in the way that Matthew uses Panta te ethne and mikroi, all the nations and the little ones, in the vast majority of his gospel. In the first 24 chapters, Matthew says ethne when he talks about the Gentiles, and mikroi when he talks about the disciples. So this second interpretation in the 18th century that emerged goes to say and concludes that Jesus is judging the Gentiles only based on the way that they treated the Mikroi, the believers. And the third interpretation, the one that you probably went to without even batting an eye, is that Ponte Te Ethne is all people across all time, and Mikroi, the little ones, the least of these in society. That Jesus is judging all people on the way that they judge, on the way that they treat the most vulnerable. So asking, am I a sheep or a goat, maybe isn't the best question to center ourselves upon today because the interpretations of this text are so contested. Because oftentimes asking this question just spins our wheels of shame and fear, making us think that we must achieve salvation. And because oftentimes human nature is more complicated than this binary. If we're honest with ourselves, most times we are sheep and or goats. In the span of one day, we do sheep-like things and we do goat-like things. We extend kindness to a stranger one moment and then walk by a person experiencing homelessness the next. We are both. So maybe a more fruitful question for us to ask ourselves today, to center all of our meditations upon, is when was I the least of these? Dr. Elaine Pagels is a professor of Christian history at Princeton University. And she includes Christian history, asking the question, how, hold on one second, how did Christianity transform from a movement characterized by radical love to a system of doctrine? And she, in her work, zones in on the early church. And she talks about the early church and contrasts it with the Roman society at that time. In Rome, in the first and second, sector, first and second century, if you were sick, you would go to the Greek god of healing 
and you'd have to pay the temple priests when you were consulted about herbs and exercises, herbs and exercises and baths. And if you wanted to secure your eternal salvation, you would go to another great God where you'd have to pay large initiation fees, oftentimes having to pay even more for offerings and the clothings and all of the different rituals that you would need to do in order to secure your eternal salvation. The work of the early church, she writes, presented a jarring contrast. She writes, People in need could find almost immediate practical help from the early Christians almost anywhere in the empire, where great cities then as now were crowded with people who were struggling to survive. Unlike members of other clubs and societies in Rome that collected dues and fees to pay for feasts, members of the Christian family contributed money to a fund to support orphans abandoned on the street and garbage dumps. Early Christians brought food, medicine, and companionship to prisoners forced to work in mines, banished prison islands, or held in jail. Sociologist Dr. Rodney Stark also studies the spread of early Christianity, and he claims that a turning point in the spread was actually the Galen Plague. It took place in the second century in Rome, it was a pandemic that swept across the Roman Empire from Italy to East Asia. And if someone that you knew was sick, you fled away because people who contracted this virus died in agony. Everyone ran, including Galen himself, who the plague is even named after, fled to different countries. But Dr. Rodney Stark, he claims that the Christian stayed and stayed because of these very words. He suggests to us as modern readers to try and read this passage as if reading it for the first time. To feel the weight of this new morality that Jesus is setting forth. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was an immigrant, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly I say to you, as you did to the one of the least of my brethren, you did to me. But the truth of the matter is that most of us or many of us here in our congregation haven't experienced some of the more dire situations that Jesus sets forth. Not having access to clean water, being starving, being imprisoned, not having clothes. Because of the collective power and privilege of this congregation, it may be hard for us to directly relate to some of the more intense scenarios that Jesus outlines here. But we have all walked through the valleys of life. Walking through the heart soul. or if we really matter at all. So today I ask you, when were you the least of these? When were you sick and someone nursed you to health? When were you going through depression and someone stayed with you? When were you mourning and someone shared silence with you? When was someone Christ to you and you to them? Because when we meditate on this question, when we remember the moment when we received mercy, when we remember when we were at the end of our rope, we can't help but pay that mercy forward. When we remember how God loved us at those moments, that same love overflows from us to find a home in others. Because when we remember how we were cared for, when we were the least of these, we use our privilege and power to race to the back of the line so that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. 
Dr. Elaine Pagels, the scholar that I mentioned earlier, actually claims that it is the replication of this mercy that caused the rapid spread of Christianity. That this radical mercy that early Christians showed after receiving it first themselves resulted in the attraction of large groups of newcomers despite the risks. She writes, the generosity that the early Christians showed could be ordinarily expected only from one's family if that. This generosity attracted crowds of newcomers, especially after the Galen plague. And why did they do this, you might ask? Because of God's love. These early Christians believed that God, who created humankind, actually loved the human race and evoked love in return. And that what their God required was that human beings love one another and offer help, especially to the neediest. Like these early Christians, my friends, we are both recipients and bearers of this radical mercy. When we were the least of these and were met by a caring partner, friend, stranger, or therapist, this love but can't help but then go and do the same for another. This love can't help but replicate itself because we were just them and they were just us. A friend of mine got into a really bad car accident a, a few weeks ago. She broke her hand, her, her wrist, her arm, her wrist, her knee, and her foot when she veered off the road and hit a tree. She's been in rehab for about a week now and will continue to be in rehab for the foreseeable future. And when I was on the phone with her a few days ago, she shared this with me. Being here has made me realize how difficult it is to be in a facility like this. Nobody knows how hard it is until they've done it and nobody thinks it's gonna to happen to them. The guy in the room next to me yells for the nurse 18 times a day. It took me a week to stop being annoyed and realize that he yells because it's so, so, so hard being in here right now. And I get to leave eventually and he doesn't. She told me to tell my congregation that if you know someone in a long-term care facility, then call them. Take them food that lines up with their diets or order it for them. You can still be in community even when you can't be in person with those in need. Friends, we are called to serve the least of these because they are us and we are them. Just like the early Christians, we are recipients and bearers of this gospel, this radical mercy. We are both unbeliever and believer. We are both able to identify with Jesus in our weakness and judged by the way we fail to pursue justice by him. We are both a sheep and a goat. And the paradox of this nature, the push and pull of these seemingly contradictions, finds itself in a family of paradox. As paradox is no stranger to Jesus. Jesus, the least of these Jesus the Savior, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the King, Jesus the hungry, Jesus the stranger, Jesus the thirsty, Jesus the prisoner. When I find out that my friend got into an accident, may I always rush to the hospital. When you hear of a child without access to clean water and flint, may your throat grow dry. When we walk by people experiencing homelessness on the streets, may we shiver and then ask them how we can help. Because Jesus calls the least of these his very own family a kinship unlike anything the Roman Empire had ever seen. A kinship that loves one another to the point of folly as our king himself died for such a love as this. And so this is the radical kingdom of God. 
a family of believers that replicate acts of mercy because we have been recipients of such. A community of kin that cares for the needs of sheep and goat alike without asking whether or not they deserve our help. As Dorothy Day so pointedly said, the gospel takes away our right forever to discriminate between the deserving and undeserving poor. Jesus, the person in the peace. Jesus, the refugee. Jesus, the elderly woman getting evicted from her apartment this week. Jesus, the man calling out to the nurse 18 times a day. Jesus, the man incarcerated in prison for a drug sentence. Jesus, the king. 